The World Leaders Forum was created by Lee Bollinger to bring to our university women and men, not just with political authority, but also intellectual authority, to present their thoughts to us without fear of anything except public engagement and discussion. It is in that spirit that Amartya Sen and Prabhat Patnaik have been invited to speak today at this event for which we've all been keenly waiting. Their theme today is India at Crossroads, an apt topic since one meaning of crossroads is, in my dictionary, a crucial point, especially when a decision is to be made. And as we know, the general elections in India will be underway this month, an election that will decide whether India will continue even more steeply down the path of right-wing religious nationalism or return to some of its past ideals of secularism and economic policies intended to uplift the lives of poor and working people. But, of course, a proper concern for the decisions we are about to make for the future depend vitally on how we understand our past and our present. And so it's really to provide that analysis in depth that we brought our two guests here. I'm going to introduce our speakers with much more brevity than they deserve and command, and this um, only so as to give them as much time to speak themselves. We really want to hear from them, not about them. They are both figures of international renown, with a brace of awards and prizes and honorary degrees between them. Amartya Sen is the Lamont Professor at Harvard, where he teaches both economics and philosophy. He's a Nobel Laureate in Economics, has been the Master of Trinity College in Cambridge, as well as the Drummond Professor of Political Economy at Oxford. Before that, he taught at Jadavpur University, University of Calcutta, and the Delhi School of Economics. His books include Collective Choice and Social Welfare, Poverty and Famines, Development and Freedom, and most recently, The Idea of Justice. Prabhat Patnaik, who went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, taught economics at Cambridge University for some years before responding to a call to join and help set up the Center for Economic Studies at the newly formed Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi nobly forsaking a uh, most promising international academic career to serve his own country, where he has taught ever since until retiring last year. His books include Accumulation and Stability Under Capitalism, The Value of Money, Retreat to Unfreedom, and most recently, An Economic Theory of Imperialism. <coughs> They're both here because they are, as this event's nomenclature has it, world leaders of human thought about public life, by which I mean that what makes them stand out, apart from the measurable productions and achievements that I've just mentioned, is that they believe something that most leaders increasingly have ceased to believe, that ideas make a difference to politics and public life that it makes all the difference to politics and public life, whether you put truth in the first place or the second. I will hand over things now to Ruchira Gupta, who has very kindly agreed to moderate and chair the proceedings this evening. Ms. Gupta is a <coughs> very important public figure herself, a journalist and activist of deep and consistent commitments to women's issues. She has worked over the years with the United Nations, the BBC, and a wide range of international newspapers before she became the founder and chair of the remarkable NGO called Apne Aap, <coughs> whose work has been recognized with honors both by the House of Lords in Britain and the Clinton Foundation in this country. 
Her scholarly writing is focused mostly on human drug trafficking and the legal and moral resources with which it must be confronted. Colombia is very privileged to have these speakers tonight, and I ask you to join me in welcoming them. Good evening, everyone. I'm um, very honored to be chairing this uh, discussion today at a very critical time in India. India is going to polls on the 11th of April, and the election results will be declared on 23rd of May. There are more than 450 parties which will be fighting elections this time, and more than 500 million people who will cast their votes. The unfortunate part of this great exercise is that we have found that there will be some things missing. 21 million women are missing from the ballots this time, as are more than 12% uh, Muslims and Dalits. These are challenges that the Election Commission should have and is trying to overcome, but has not been able to in time for this election. The other challenges that India faces as we go to poll this time is a creeping fascism which seems to have overtaken many of our institutions and also challenged the very law and order which has been the stability and the growth of India, the bedrock of India, and replaced by vigilantism as a new government uh, informed by very right wing and uh, very, um, from 1929 onwards, uh, a dialogue with Mussolini and Hitler uh, started in 1929 and then went on to become a political party by the time India became independent. Um, this government has been in power for the last four years and uh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, this government has not just eroded our institutions, but has also made the very life of individual citizens insecure, especially Muslims, Dalits, and women. There has been rape with impunity uh, and there has been um, attacks on Muslims and Dalits uh, in village after village in the name of love jihad, cow vigilantism. Uh, there has been uh, erosion of our monetary systems. There has been something called demonetization. And I have two of the world's greatest experts who will talk about it. There has been a deep aggregarian crisis. There has been an attack on the university system. Um, one of the universities from which Prabhat himself is uh, one of the founders of <coughs> Jawaharlal Nehru University has been under great attack. Students have been on the run, uh, arrested falsely. So for India, there is a lot at stake in this election to keep our democracy intact, to keep our inst institutions intact, and to keep our de democratic norms intact. And this election is going to be very critical in defining what India does in the coming years and what India becomes in the coming years. Um, with the wisdom of Prabhat and Amartya Sen, who are here with us today, I don't have to say more. Uh, so I would like to start by asking Professor Patnaik, uh, Prabhat, uh, as we all call him in India, uh, to uh, speak about what his thoughts are at this critical moment in our history. Thank you, Ruchira, Professor Sen, friends. It's a real pleasure and privilege for me to be here, to be part of this event, and to be part of this panel, which includes Professor Amartya Sen, who, apart from everything else, also happens to be my teacher in the Delhi School of Economics. He was my teacher of economics. As Ruchira said, India certainly is currently at the crossroads in a very obvious way. The elections which are coming are going to be extremely crucial. We know that for the last five years, we have had a government that has used a combination of state terrorism and street terrorism to suppress freedom of expression. State terrorism has been used through acts like the UAPA, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, uh, like the sedition laws, which are a hangover from the colonial times under which Gandhi had been incarcerated, National Security Act and so on. Street terrorism has been inflicted through lynch mobs, through uh, street thugs who go around interfering, terrorizing, intimidating people. Muslims and religious minorities in general have been made to feel that they are second class citizens. 
you find a concept of jingoistic nationalism in which, which has nothing to do with the kind of inclusive anti-colonial nationalism of the earlier period, but this jingoistic nationalism which typically takes nationalism to be synonymous, not just with Hindutva, but in fact it takes it synonymous to be, to, to, with the leader of the current governments. In fact, day before yesterday, on Sunday, a speech was made by the current Prime Minister in which he said, anyone who abuses me is actually working for Pakistan. So you have that kind of a jingoistic notion of nationalism so that everybody who's critical of the government is accused as being anti-national is quite interesting because that basically also means that people who are critical are at the same time vilified and demonized. We have had periods earlier, for instance, during the emergency of the 1970s, in which the state repression was used against critics of the government, but the honor of the critics of the government was never questioned. In, in other words, it was not as if they were kind of portrayed as being dishonorable, traitors to the country, anti-national and such like. You also have, at the same time, a closeness between the government on the one hand and the corporate sector on the other, which is quite unprecedented in the history of India. In fact, the current prime minister came for his swearing in in a plane which is owned by one of the rich corporate businessmen. I would just like to draw a contrast here. When Jawaharlal Nehru's wife, Kamla, was dying of tuberculosis in the 1930s in a sanatorium in Switzerland, he was short of money to go and visit her. And G.D. Birla, who was actually a big businessman who was helping and supporting and financing the Congress, offered to buy him his ticket and, and, and to finance his trip, and he said no. So that, you know, the, the distance which the leadership tried to maintain vis-a-vis -vis big business is a distance which now has been totally obliterated. And it is in this context that you find, as Ruchira said, the attack on institutions, attack on centers of learning, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Hyderabad Central Uni University, the Pune Film Institute, uh, the MS University Fine Arts School. In other words, the finest centers of learning and thought in the country are being destroyed. And there is a general promotion of unreason. Because if you have to portray, for instance, past Muslim emperors as villains in some ways, in that case, you have to rewrite history in a manner where evidence should not count against your position. Therefore, a certain element of destruction of thought is essential to this project. Now, all this is going on, and all this is, of course, an affront to the Constitution. It's a violation of the basic values of our constitution. And consequently, the elections we are going to have now are absolutely crucial. You see, they're not crucial only in the sense that all that is happening is ethically repugnant. I think they're crucial in a deeper sense because I think the values of the constitution themselves are derived from a certain implicit social compact which underlies modern India. I, I do believe this. I think it was something which was articulated in the 1931 Karachi Congress. And of course, it is something which gained currency during the anti-colonial struggle and the constitution is derived from it. Now, anything that challenges that implicit social compact on the basis of which modern India has been formed is something which actually undermines the very foundations of the modern Indian nation. And if that is the case, then unless we get a different verdict in these elections, India might well join the rank of the so-called failed states where you'd continue to have internal strife in a way where the country just does not become an unpleasant place. It actually becomes an unviable country altogether. So these elections are extremely crucial. And as Ruchira said, we certainly are at crossroads in that 
very clear, definite sense. But I have a feeling that we're also at crossroads in a deeper sense, and that is the following. Suppose we ask ourselves the question, if the current political regime is overthrown in the elections, would we actually have overcome the threat of fascism? And my fear is no, because I think the conjuncture that gives rise to the threat of fascism would not have disappeared. Basically, during the neoliberal period, you have had a situation where not only have inequalities increased enormously, income and wealth inequalities, but actually hunger has increased. Absolute poverty, defined in terms of nutritional intake, has actually increased. Now, if that is the case, for quite some time, the neoliberal regime, the neoliberal economic regime, continued because it continued to infuse in people the hope that, all right, today you are bad, today you are not in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good position, but tomorrow you are going to get the benefits of this growth, very high rates of GDP growth you are having, sooner or later you are going to get the benefits of it. What has happened more recently is that the neoliberal regime itself has run into a kind of economic cul-de-sac. Now, to the extent that is the case, this promise of good days to come is something which no longer can actually persuade people. And in a situation like this, additional props are needed. And what you have in India, in my view, is a kind of prop in which there is a, a, there's an alliance between big business on the one hand and the Hindutva elements on the other hand. In my perception, Narendra Modi's political role consists in actually having brought about this alliance between big business and uh, the Hindutva elements. Now, this alliance is something which, which invariably underlies all kinds of fascism, and this is the kind that we are witnessing at this moment. Now, one of the things, however, is that unless, therefore, we overcome this conjuncture, unless in some sense we manage to extricate the country from the kind of economic travails that it currently faces, this kind of fascist threat would continue. You may have a new government. The new government would do pretty much the same thing that previous governments have been doing. It will become unpopular, and these people would come back to power. And through all these ups and downs, they're going out of power and coming into power, you will have a progressive fascification of society. And that is something which actually worries me greatly. I think this, the, the, the idea, therefore, that something basic needs to be done, that in some sense the hitherto drawn boundaries of the neoliberal economic regime have got to be transcended, is, 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 is an issue which many people are feeling. And I suspect the Congress's recent manifesto where they are talking about Nunatam Yojana, providing a basic minimum to everybody, is an appreciation of the fact. But it's just not enough, because I believe this idea of handing out largesse within a broadly neoliberal pattern of the economy is utterly inadequate. What is really required is a set of universal benefits which people must acquire as a right, a set of universal, justiciable economic rights is something that can actually get us out of this particular conjuncture. Now, I have made some calculations according to which, suppose you take a minimum of five rights, right to food, right to employment, failing which there are un uh, adequate employment, un unemployment benefits, right to free quality publicly funded healthcare, right to free quality publicly funded education, and right to old age pension and disability benefits. Just take these five minimal rights. If you want to implement them, it would immediately require about 9% of the GDP. I remember Professor Sen once saying that in India we can get rid of poverty if we can spend 5% of GDP. I would say that even introducing these rights would require 9% of GDP 
easy to finance because raising finance of that order in a country that has no wealth tax whatsoever is extremely uh, uh, you know, easy. It is by no means difficult. But what it would require is that you have to reorder the economy, reorient the economy to produce a whole set of goods and services to meet domestic requirements, which is not really related to ideas of export-led growth, which are so fashionable and current under the neoliberal regime. So I think underlying the immediate crossroads that we face about the election, whom is going to bring to power and so on, there are deeper crossroads that in some sense we either resuscitate the social compact on which modern India is founded or we would join the ranks of failed states. And I think that is a deeper crossroads that we really have to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhat. Uh, he's put everything in a... He's put everything in a nutshell, and now I would like Professor Sen to speak a few words. Very difficult to speak about a subject where everything has been put in a nutshell. Already. <laughs> <laughs> but I accept that description. I, I think um, we have to distinguish between, and Prabhat made a fantastic presentation, but we have to distinguish between various different things that's going on right now and why the present moment, including the elections, but not just the elections, are so important. The, uh, uh, it's not the case that uh, before the Modi government came, the country was a very happy place, or a just place. Uh, there were great inequalities. Uh, what has happened is these inequalities have been magnified and made into a standard part of living in a way it wasn't. There was a certain amount of shame about the inequalities, which seemed to have somehow been eliminated, and we have to ask, why has that been possible? And the changes are really dramatic. There's no question about that. I would take a slight, uh, um, not an emendation, but addition to what Lucia said when you were talking about Dalits and the Muslims. There's also a huge category of scheduled tribes. And in terms of the category of deprivation, the studies that we have done in the Fatichi Trust brings out that the scheduled tribes of these deprived groups have the worst of the, uh, uh, of the deal in India, uh, in almost every aspect. So, um, th but the main thing here is to recognize that what's happening is that the underdogs of the society are being treated in a, in, a, in, a, in a terrible way, and yet in a way that um, even if there is a agitation and Dalits have been organized, um, the, the impact of it isn't very great, and we have to ask why. And this is also where such issues, which are not immediately connected with deprivation, like freedom of speech, uh, use of the right to information, etc., come in. Um, and it's very important to recognize that uh, the redressing of inequalities come not only from the actions of the underdog, but it comes also from people who belong to a different part of the society, but who are moved by it. And there's nothing extraordinary about that. This whole idea 
that people only look after their own interests and nothing else, which is sometimes attributed to Marxian materialist philosophy, is neither Marx's idea <laughs> nor is it a particularly um, uh, sustainable position. It's uh, as uh, Eric Kopfbaum in a very wonderful article, which at last is not read much these days, uh, which came out in Marx's quarterly in uh, 1955. I remember it was coming out when I was taking my exams uh, in Cambridge. Um, <coughs> this is about material conditions and ideas. And uh, it's somehow been associated with Marx, the idea that he emphasized the importance of material condition uh, and, you know, uh, and uh, dialectical materialism and all that. What Hartwell is arguing is that the position here has been, and Marx is, and it, it has also earlier interest, I think you can bring in Smith into it too, is that the Ideas have an influence on the material condition. Material conditions have an influence on ideas. Now it so happens, as Hobbes argues, that in 19, in the 19th century, when Marx was writing, the world was full of people who were saying the ideas influence material conditions. Hegel, for example, lots of them. And therefore, what was not being done so much is the importance of material conditions and ideas. They concentrated on that. But as Hoffman said, the world has changed. If you have to sometimes deal with, and even if I don't want to, students ask me, rational choice theory, that assumes that everyone pursues his own material advantage. Now that is a gross materialism. What's, uh, Hofbaum called vulgar materialism. Given that, it's very important to emphasize the neglected part, namely ideas of dramatic influence on material conditions. And in many ways, that's as important today in the election time as, as, as any other. And which is why these things about the, the suppression of uh, freedom of speech the uh, suppression of facts. Uh, I see from the New York Times that it's conceivable that some of the war photos that were distributed about Indian army uh, driving the hell out of Pakistan actually came from uh, uh, pictures which had nothing to do with it. Sometimes other pictures, people dying of dying of um, drought and starvation. Sometimes even, as uh, they to be told, from war games. These were, the Pakistani attack that was shown was apparently taking place in, in, a, in, in, a, in a little room where a war game was being played. Now, are these important? They're important because the ideas that we form, uh, the, those who argue for freedom of speech or for uh, 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 of not being restrained by belief in religion and so on, are doing something which has a major impact on the way the, the peasants and the workers and the, the scheduled class and the scheduled class live. And I think that is a very important thing to, to recognize in this situation. Now, what's happening, if you look at Modi thing, there are two elements in the present um, uh, uh, state of affairs that we have. Um, um, one is what I would call bias. And, and sectarianism. Mm -hmm. It can take a religious form, like being anti-Muslim. Anti it can take uh, <coughs> a class form. It 
then also they get cast from. Tribal is a very big thing, the way, yeah. Uh, you know, in Bengali, there, there are three. We don't have gender in Bengali. Not at all, we are very. Uh, we lost that. People who don't like, who lecture constantly about ancient India but don't like studying it, should know <laughs> that Sanskrit had three genders. Then around, the, around about 2,000 years ago, there was a reversal of gender in, in the particularly the Sorosani part of uh, this and uh, of the inheritance, so that his wife, as in English, his is masculine, not her wife. But the corresponding French would be her wife, mm. is dominated. What happened is Hindi moved from his wife to her wife in that period. And Magadi, which is from the Bihar region, and even though Bengali don't like admitting it, most of, quite a lot of Bengali culture had come from Bihar. <laughs> and so, Magadhi started dropping gender altogether, and Adha Magadhi, which was the next stage, dropped it altogether. And Oriya, Bengali, and Assamese came out of Adha Magadhi, and you don't have the gender. However, we do have this big difference between respect and disrespect. So you have Aap, Tum, and in Bengali, Tui. Now, if you talk with Santals, and I grew up among the Santals in Santanics and they're surrounded. They always refer to you or talk with you as Tui. Mm. And I wonder how. But the reason is that the only way that others talk with him is Tui, and that's the Bengali they have learned. So from the reflection of their, in their speech, this is very Chomskyan, reflection in the speech, you can guess how they have been addressed. So the complete lack of respect on this and, and not worrying about them. And uh, you know, Santa Nikita is a great place where I was born and grew up. Uh, it's difficult to take people, make people take as much interest about them, that, despite the fact that the, that the leaders like Rabindranath had talked again and again on that subject. So there's all these issues. So there's bias, deep bias. And the second is what I would call magic. And magic is very important in Modi. Demonetization is part of the magic. Mm -hmm. I think anyone with train, is any kind of training in economics would find it difficult to believe why making it illegal to hold notes of certain kind would improve the first performance of the, of the people. I mean, there was some idea that you would catch, catch thieves, catch the people who have fake money. But A, if you really look through it, you will recognize that people don't hold it in fake, no, in big denomination, no. They convert it into property like land and, and housing, housing very much. So, there was a real belief in, in, in magic, and the, and the magic is also extended in, in the um, pictures of uh, um, uh, war, war toys into attack on Pakistan. And actually, we are in this odd position. You know, the country of Gandhi is now going around claiming we actually killed many more people. Hmm. As if that was a, would have been a tremendously good thing. And I have to say that returning the pilot who fell down, and it was not a victory of the Indian side, and it's so uh, somewhat surprising generosity on the part of the government to send it because usually it's done at the end of the war. That's what happened, say, in the 1971 
war between Pakistan and India, where India did have a decisive victory, and people were repatriated, but after the war ended. This happened in the middle. But to convert that into a victory of India somehow, we got somebody, a pilot, who was shot down. We were afraid that he would be tortured and possibly executed. Instead, he was generously relieved. I mean, there's a kind of magic in saying this is to the glory of the present government. And I'm told that the support of the government dramatically increased after that. Now, that is magic. You know, I remember in my college days, or school days, really, people would ask who are the great figures, and some people said Gandhi, Gandhiji, and some would say Tagore, and one chap said Fisi Sarkar. <laughs> <laughs> that was a magician. Now, the idea that you see here is not Gandhi or Tagore, that is Fisi Sarkar. <laughs> By the way, I mean, I was a great devotee of Fisi Sarkar, so I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> blame him. But there is, there is magic. There is the love of magic. And that's quite important in the election. And right now, I think resisting magic is as important as almost anything else that's going on. So what is the form in which inequality takes place? I would say um, actually quoting Marx again, 1875, his last book critique of Gotha program. He's taking here, it's a very interesting book, I really recommend people to read that. It's also the book there where two ideas, uh, which are not what I'm talking about here, but I have to mention. Then one of them is he, you see, he's criticizing the German Workers' Party for their program, which is the Gotha program, and he's providing a critique. And there, the German Workers' Party said, all value is produced by labor. And Marx says, what nonsense. There's labor, there's land, there are natural resources. This is almost the first discussion of the importance of environmental concern in, the, in, mm. in, 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 in human society. <coughs> the, um, there's also a subject in which I got very involved later. It's about identity. And he, when he's criticizing the Workers' Party for what? He said that they treat human beings only who are workers, only as workers. But a worker is not only a worker. He's also a human being with many, many other characteristics. And this whole idea of forgetting everything else of a worker, accepting the fact that he is a worker or she is a worker is a huge mistake. Now, that's also a very big discussion, of, in my judgment, on identity. But the main thrust of the work is to say the Workers' Party says that what we have to do is to make sure that people are not exploited. Very important thing. And whatever they produce, they should get it in a way that it doesn't go away to others. Uh, and it's not defined in the neoclassical way about factor of production, uh, but more like, as Morris Dove puts it, Mark Bloch's way, when Mark Bloch said, feudal lords lived on the labor of serfs. That doesn't mean that their feudal lords' land was unproductive, but somehow, Labor is not comparable with owning land. Working is not the same kind of thing as possessing land. Now, that is, that goes back in Marx's writing a lot. And Workers' Party is emphasizing that must stop. Now, Marx actually says, that's not enough. It's his idea, or not only his idea, but among other people, his idea, because 
and this identity is to come in, workers have needs also. Suppose somebody is not very productive, but has a lot of need. Doesn't society owe something to that person? So I think there are two concerns here, works and needs. And the book ends with a, I mean, the book <laughs> brings out to me since I was very interested in Marx from, from my young days. What a, um, what is um, dedicated, detached intellectual Marx was, because he says, so what's that? So they, they made a mistake, because work is only one thing we looked at, needs is another. Can we provide satisfaction of needs? And he said, we would be able to, but that we need a reorientation of mental attitude and also much greater affluence. Can we do it now? No, it can't be done. So what are you talking about then? Since ultimately you agree with the German Workers' Party. What you say, you mustn't forget that there are needs. Mm. That's the point, which is a very important point to, to make. And it's, it's similarly, I was amused by, actually I don't know whether I have this Marxist discussion on freedom. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, wonderful, uh, discussing that we should be free to do what we like. Uh, uh, we can uh, um, yeah, produce, uh, we can do industrial action. Let me get that industrial action. In the in the in the morning, and cultivation in the <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, uh, he is he is quite wonderful there. Uh, uh, and uh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, what we need is to make it possible for me to do one thing today, another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner. <laughs> now, I think rear cattle in the evening brings out what a superb urban creature <laughs> Marx was. I don't think anyone who rears cattle would choose evening at a good moment to do it. He was in very good shape when he came to criticize after dinner. <laughs> he knew that very well. So I think What's happening, I, this is actually part of my memoir I'm trying to write, it is a chapter called What to Make of Mark. The fact is that in the process of thinking about it, and sometimes very abstractly, these are very abstract thoughts, he was opening up areas which are really important today. Now today, if you look at it, it may not be that we can satisfy everyone's needs, but we can go somewhat in that direction. And the deprivation that come, comes from both deprivation of work, either unemployment or low wages, or deprivation of needs, not being able to have health care, having enough food, going hungry. Uh, extraordinary how important this needs picture is. It, when I was uh, started the Fertici Trust, the year after I got the Nobel that I had the opportunity of doing it and looking at it, it was amazing going to the schools, how many of the children came to the school without having eaten anything and how hard it was for them to do multiplication table on an hungry stomach. So we have to look at needs and work and if there's any way in which we can say that China has done something dramatically better than India, not in democracy, I'm afraid. But when it comes to uh, native poverty, a poor in India does not know where to go when your child has illness. Ayushman is not going to help you. Ayushman would help you if you have lived long, long time and then you have an extensive operation, 
which a private hospital will provide for you, and then you take the bill and ask the government to pay. That does nothing for the girl with the empty stomach. So I think the basic, the, the needs issue, the, the poor in India doesn't know where to go to, uh, what decent school there is, where is the, uh, where you take, take your child to hospital, when you are uh, um, uh, deprived of basic social security, what to do with it. Now China, with all its problems, and there are many problems indeed, poverty doesn't take that form. So when people say that China has done better in terms of income, yes, it has. But that's not the main problem. The main issue, and it's all, not always been like that, the main issue has been to deal with the fundamental needs that human beings have in a way that the poor in China do not tend to suffer, excepting in very rare cases, and, and, and in India quite standardly suffer. So I think we have to turn our picture to needs and work and to the freedom of speech, because as I was trying to say, freedom of speech is central to all these things. We won't talk about works and needs. We will talk only about Ausman parts and not about what happened to basic health care and, and, and so on, if freedom of speech is, is interrupted and, 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 and has to be dealt with. I repeat again by saying it's not the case that these problems didn't exist earlier. But these problems have become dramatically more important recently. And I think the freedom of speech and I mean, earlier on there were freedom of speech of various kinds. After all, India was the first country to uh, ban satanic verses. And there are all kinds of ways freedom of speech was affected. But it had not got the form in which all universities are now run by RSS people who know exactly what to do. And universities of which you would think India had reason to be proud. India had the oldest university in the world, namely Nalanda, which I had the good fortune of being chancellor of for a few years until it became clear that no help from the government would come until I am removed. And they encouraged Giorgio from Singapore to take it, and George was very reluctant, but I think told him you have to take it, because that's the only way we get the money. But I was mistaken, George was right, because the moment I moved away and George came in, everything he asked for didn't happen either. So, and that is for the oldest university in the world, not the invented airplanes in the Vedas. <laughs> uh, Pushpakarat and so on. <laughs> Not Garuda flying you up and down. That happens in Indonesia <laughs> in the form of an airline. <laughs> but but Nalanda was sacrificed. And so have been many other things. Yeah, I mean the even on the Vedas, which I I may be one of the few persons who have read the Vedas all of it. But you know, I think the song of creation, Mandal 10, asks the question, does God exist? How do we know? And if God existed, and if he's still alive, would he remember all that? How does he remember? And so on. That is Rig Veda. It's also the first discussion in Rig Veda about gambling and the dilemma of the gambler. Who, who were irresistibly drawn to it, what the Greeks would call weakness of the will, uh, 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 the, and, and discussed a, uh, a, a, a lot of it. Uh, it was discussed in, in, in the Vedas uh, quite brilliantly. But instead of that, 
it will say that, and, and mathematics happened dramatically in India in the, from Aryabhat onward. Largely, and, and we have to accept that after the impulse came from influence of Babylon and, and Greece, that made a big difference, a dramatic difference. And then, of course, the Arabs were the great exponents of Indian mathematics. And so there was this, all this was going on, not to understand that and to think of India as a kind of uh, self-made creature mm. germinating like a gram on the ground alone. Like a swimsuit. That magic. And I think we have to get rid of not only the vast, but also magic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sen. And uh, you know, what is at stake here? Both of you have uh, talked about the immediate and just a journey through time and what we are looking forward to and what can happen. Uh, Professor Sen, of course, has spoken about basic needs as human rights and how we need to concentrate on that. Can a government, if, it, if India moves more towards fascism, can a government which is not inclusive essentially in its thought can it deliver these basic needs, uh, especially based on the track record of the last four years where, you know, welfare state has been dismantled very fast. Um, and also, uh, Professor Sen spoke about freedom of speech, which is based on freedom of thought. Can a fascist mindset, uh, which is closing down universities and uh, changing history textbooks, other textbooks which we are studying, geography, history, everything, uh, can that then change the way we think or stop us from thinking altogether? What does this mean? What does it imply what's coming up in this election now? Prabhat, if mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things, I think Professor Sen said that, you know, that inequality of course existed before. Inequality has been increasing. As a matter of fact, I think uh, poverty and hunger, poverty defined in terms of hunger and nutritional norms has been increasing. Uh, but one of the things which has happened in the more recent period is if you make a calculation, you know, I mean, there is an enormous peasant protest at this moment all over the country. The peasantry has been a neglected sector, a neglected group in the last several years. Ever since the neoliberal policies came, the kind of state support that the peasantry used to get uh, has dwindled. But if you look particularly at the last few years, then I, I made a calculation that suppose you take 2013-14 as your starting point. And you look at the incomes generated in the entire agricultural sector, the total incomes of everybody engaged in it. Then in real terms, per capita income in the agricultural sector has not increased at all. It has actually marginally decreased. If you take the latest year for which we have figures, 2016-17 compared to the base. And half the country's population is still agriculture dependent. So you have a situation where, of course, uh, uh, the last few years have been particularly bad. And I think which is the reason why we have had peasant suicides and so on earlier, but now you are beginning to have a kind of peasant assertion in which I see a lot of hope. I mean, I think the more the discourse shifts away from Hindutva and Pakistan and so on towards issues of peasant conditions of life, towards issues of unemployment and so on, the more, in fact, people would begin to assert themselves in the elections and thereafter as citizens. But the more they actually start talking about Hindutva and Pakistan, the more they become victims of the magic that Professor Sen was talking about. You know, on this magic, I just want to recollect an, uh, uh, an occasion that you see after demonetization, everybody had great difficulties because you had absolutely no cash 
and so you went and queued up. You got up at four o'clock in the morning to go and queue up outside the banks and so on. And it was extremely inconvenient. And people simply could not believe that anything as distressing as this could be inflicted upon them without very good reasons. As a result, the more you faced hardships, the more you thought what a wonderful government we have. They, they, they don't actually uh, show any fear in inflicting this hardship on me. And that just shows how committed they are to the good of the country. So that's the kind of magic, you know, that you, you do something, you do something pretty ruthlessly, shock and awe. And as a result, the more you kind of, you know, put shock and awe into people, for a while, obviously, because now that has worn off, but for a while, it actually can have this kind of magical impact that Professor Sen was talking about. But I think I, I, I see a great deal of hope in the emergence of, if you like, secular, disworldly protests, you know, on, on, on material issues, on issues of peasant life and so on. Professor Sen, uh, you know, also uh, you spoke about magic, and magic is so essential to fasc fascism and uh, the magic is essential to fascism, and how Hitler also used notions of mysticism. You know, the great Nordic person who was of a superior race should rule the world, and talking about a past which did not exist, uh, hinting at a future which would never be and inciting people to create the other and the violence. It was all about exclusion. So uh, what's at stake real, really here in this election is that what approach do we choose in India? The politics of inclusion or the politics of exclusion? And what do you feel that can the magic uh, that is associated with the present ruling party, you know, the kind of clothes the Prime Minister wears with the turbans and all of that, uh, the kind of slogans he uses, um, the kind of campaigns that are run um, are so full of symbolic uh, aesthetics which are so full of blood and orange. And how, how is it going to play out? And what really is at stake then? And what, what should India be doing now? I've asked you four questions in one. <laughs> We have to uh, um, articulate these concerns. And uh, you know, I, there is a, um, a kind of old wisdom saying, uh, just speaking about something doesn't make a difference. The fact is, it does make a difference. Because you have to appreciate what's going on and not be shy about mentioning you mentioned about magic being important for fascism. You're doing something on fascism, aren't you? Yes. OK. Well, you see, when the fascist party was originally expanding in Italy in the 1921-22, there's a nice story which, uh, my, by the way, my late wife, Eva's family, was in the resistance, and her father was killed by Mussolini two days before Americans came to Rome. So, and uh, so the, there's a lot of stories about fascists. One of my favorites is about a fascist recruiter mm. who tried to recruit a, a, a villager to fascism. And he said, you know, you should be a fascist <laughs> because we're doing lots of things. This area used to be full of malaria. That's all gone. The trains are running on time. The municipality is working beautifully. Why shouldn't you join the fascists? And he said, well, really, I can't join the fascists. Why not? And then he gave this lame reply. He said, well, because you see, my, not only that I'm a socialist, but my father was a socialist. My grandfather was a socialist. How could I possibly join the fascist party? To which the fascist recruiter says, what kind of a nonsensical argument is this? If your father had been a murderer and grandfather had been a murderer, what would you have done then? To which this villager replies, saying, well, then, of course, 
I would have joined the fascist party. <laughs> <laughs> so that thought was in his mind, but he was not articulating it. And I think we have to articulate it a bit more. Um, and I think um, the suppression, I think the, I think the media is a very important issue, yeah. Uh, and the media situation isn't as bad in India as it is in some of the countries. But it is bad in the sense that a lot more can be done and a lot more uh, fake news comes out uh, with stories which are just not true. And I think we have to capture it in the, uh, you know, we talk about material conditions and ideas in the realm of ideas and speech and exchanges as to what has gone wrong. Mm. And I think there's a lot of scope, there's a scope for that even now. We have within a few days of election. But a well-articulated story could make a, make a big difference. And we know that the media is, is controlling the media is not a guarantee. I mean, I think er Erdogan is learning about it in a hard way in Turkey today. And we could learn too. The fact is that the BGP has 20 times the wealth that Congress has. So it can't, or the, not to mention the Communist Party has. But the fact is, that's where we are. And the issue is, what can we do despite that? And this has happened again and again, whether it's in Vietnam in a big way, or in Greece at the time of the fall of the military. That has happened when the people weigh with very short on, on, on material resources, have succeeded in, in winning their way. So we have to think of, 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 of that. And uh, I, I mean, magic is very important, you're right, and that's why I brought it in. Yeah. And one of the ways to challenge is to challenge the magic that's being presented. I think the Irishman healthcare being a universal healthcare is an attempt at a rather uh, uh, extraordinary kind of magical thought because it doesn't even touch these people. It has got nothing to offer to people who don't have a primary health care. It has something to offer if you need an expensive operation and go to a private hospital and get paid. Yeah. I, I said that in a, in, a, in a speech, rather like this, I think. And then I think the head of the Irishman has said that much of him doesn't understand it. Uh, he doesn't understand because our plan is not only to do this, but also to do the other. Now here we run into a major thought, and I'm afraid it applies even to my concern about uh, spending so much money on cash rather than healthcare and education. The idea that we will do what? I mean, it's a thought that a non-economist can easily have. But for an economist, you have to recognize that if you spend more on something, you're less to spend on other things. Uh -huh. So that to say is they're not contradictory, we can do both. Everything is contradictory with a fixed budget. And everything is considered, even if it's not a fixed budget, but not very easily relaxable budget. So I think we have to argue for the right thing. The previous government didn't, has to be said, the, the, uh, that uh, the Congress government could have spent much more on basic health care than it did on basic education than it did. India has become, India had a greater reliance on private health care at the lowest level than any other country in the world with the possible exception of Pakistan. Uh, 
uh, not even one per day, by the way. But the, uh, the, the fact is that the, uh, they are dependent on private health care because there isn't public health care. And you have to depend on private health care. You don't have anything else to go by. So I think uh, agitation, I still think that in this election, we have had far less on the lack of health care and education and social security. And uh, you know, some of the, I mean, Raphael is a very good thing to spend your time on because you might think that you've got the Modi government in, in, uh, in your grip. And that may or may not be the case, but there could have been a lot more on other things in the, in the, in the election. Raphael is the magic part. Huh? It's the magic it part. It is the magic because part. Because Chokinar yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things which actually surprises me <clears throat> is that the kind of support that this kind of magic or this kind of fascism uh, commands among the educated middle classes in India. And that's, that's quite remarkable because uh, many of them I'm not talking about universities like mine and so on, where, where there is a lot of protest, but I think large numbers of people are actually taken in by this and were great supporters of Modi, yeah. particularly the educated people, you know, which is, which is quite surprising. Yeah, it's the desire for the strong man, you know, which is promoting this toxic masculinity. Uh, additionally, I suppose it may also derive from the basic caste-based mindset where you are a kind of you know, privileged person. And let's be very clear that the, that the middle class has done remarkably well in the recent period of neoliberalism. I'll give you an example. When I joined Jawaharlal Nehru University ages ago in 1973, the income I had, the basic income I had, was 700 rupees a month. Today, if somebody joins at the same level that I had, that person would get 50,000 rupees a month, minimally. So it has increased 70 times. And then I felt that as your teacher, <laughs> I got 1,200 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you were a full professor. You know, I joined as a reader or associate. But if you look at the peasant, for instance, that time, 1973, the procurement price of wheat was about 75 rupees per quintal. And today it's 1,500 rupees per quintal, so one is to 20. So, so, so even, but even an academic... adjusted, even adjusted, there is a rise. You know, yeah. you, and academics... Because you see, basically, I think the, uh, I mean, the teachers are, we are a privileged class. But not, not the most privileged in India, among the middle classes. Yeah, uh, yeah. but you know, I They're think, rather uh, at the lower end of I the... I agree, but I think I've always saw some germ of truth in Osho Rudolph's statement that there are basically two classes in India, the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think we fall as a, you know, rather lowly rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Uh, so if anyone has, there are two mics on both sides and there's somebody standing there already. So why don't you start? Uh, I would actually like to make a comment and uh, I have a question after that. Uh, first of all, uh, this is my belief and uh, maybe I am someone from the educated middle class from India, uh, from Mumbai. So I think 2014 was a la was largely a reaction to the uh, recurrent corrupt, like let's say scams, which were present in the Congress government and was not about, uh, let's say, caste system, caste-based uh, superiority or uh, the desire for a strongman. Maybe there was a desire for a strongman, but it was largely because people were fed up with the corrupt regime, let's say. And uh, like that was my comment on uh, the discussion. And my question is, um, like, I would want you guys to talk a little bit about like how big a role does uh, this rapid increase in Indian population play in the overall poverty and uh, like because in the end the resources will stay limited and if the population keeps on growing there there is going to be someone who is left out so I would like you guys to comment on that so it is the problem of the population growing fast is that right uh, pardon 
it's it's the population problem is it uh, i mean how big of a problem is it like i i recognize that it is a problem but how big of a problem is it yeah shall we take two or three questions together and then we can answer it? actually i don't like that because it as i go old and my memory is fading <laughs> <laughs> okay let me have a brief discussion of each okay yeah fine there are six people, seven people now who are going to ask questions. Okay, yeah. And we have not that much time, so. So, I, I finished, can I go? Prabhat, do you want to uh, take a shot? Well, just two comments on, 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 on each of your remarks. Uh, Corruption, corrupt regime, yes, I, I agree with you. But the point is 2014, there were all kinds of issues. And certainly one of the issues was that the government is throwing money at the Dalits through the MGNREGS and so on. So, so that was certainly a factor. So, so this business about appealing to kind of you know, upper caste prejudice against what is in India sometimes referred to as populism was certainly one factor. I'm not saying it was only one. Uh, resources and population. I mean, population growth in India is, let's say, one and a half percent per annum now. It has come down. And, and, and GDP growth, as the government has been talking about ad nauseum, is, is 7 percent. So, so how can how can population growth be the cause of poverty when per capita income is rising at five and a half percent per annum? So obviously it is to do with factors of distribution and so on, which are social factors. And to that I would add that the, uh, the studies that uh, uh, we did, including uh, Jean and Mamata Murti and so on, bring out that the biggest impact in reducing birth, birth rate is women's education and women's health care. And so there isn't a real conflict between these. And, uh, and so I agree with Prabhat, the population isn't the main problem. On the other hand, to the extent it is, uh, you can deal with it in ways which also make the life of women that much easier and better. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm also part of this educated middle class that is <laughs> deeply supportive of the current government, and I'm happy to go into why at another point in time. It's definitely not just toxic masculinity, but uh, I was really curious about, you talked a lot about these basic economic rights uh, and drew some parallels to China. So I'm curious, would you be on board with uh, a government similar to the one in China uh, if it were able to provide these basic economic rights? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like saying that if you admire the National Health Service, which came in in Britain in 1948, would you like to be in a state like a war-devastated economy <laughs> and, and uh, trade unions not yet in a position to emerge at all. You know, you have to ask, is China been able to do this because of the lack of democratic arrangement? Is that your view? Is that my view? Uh, partially, yes. Pardon? Partially. Uh, there's a lack of uh, requirement well, uh, for uh, minority uh, appeasement. As a member of educated middle class family, <laughs> <laughs> how would you say that has come about? So I would say they've been allowed to take decisions based on purely rationality and not based on, uh, like you spoke about, you know, popular opinion. And so it's while I... Popular opinion against education and healthcare. Definitely not. The education and healthcare are part of the basic rights that you mentioned. So yeah, but then why, <coughs> why should the absence of popular opinion and democracy help? Because as you mentioned, uh, a lot of people seem, most people seem to be motivated by self-interest. So if everyone is going to I, vote based on... I said, what a huge mistake that is, <laughs> that's committed. And that is a real reverse. <laughs> if I say that in, in, the, in, the, um, in the part of the literature and rationality, a mistake is often cultivated that people are motivated by self-interest. And then you say, well, you said people are motivated by self-interest. <laughs> no, I, I must have misheard you. I, I personally believe that there is a large proportion 
of people who are motivated by self-interest. Yeah, that, and uh, if that were, is the case, if you were to buy that argument... And they're motivated only by self-interest? Mo only by self-interest is different from being motivated largely by self-interest. That's what I'm asking. And I do believe that people make a lot of decisions based off the self-interest part of their thinking, which is not to claim that everybody only acts in self-interest, but that there is a large part of your decision-making that is influenced by self-interest. And when you're not, as a member of an educated middle class, uh, you're not personally experiencing a lot of uh, the downsides that a large majority of the population in India does, uh, you tend to start taking more decisions based on self-interest. And that's where I feel, and again, I'm not going, trying to draw causality between fascism and uh, a developing economy. That's not in any... No, but there's some link between this and the China argument, right? So, there, I, again, difference between causality and correlation, I'm curious no, no, as it's to... No, nothing to do with causality and correlation. <laughs> Definitely. That's a very respectable problem, but you're not addressing that. I'm... Sorry, can you repeat? Causality and correlation is a very big distinction. Yes. Which anyone who is doing either statistics or the social sciences yes. should be aware of. I didn't detect anything in your argument where that has turned out to be a critical factor. Okay. Well, it's a criticism for you. Don't say okay. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you want me to respond to. Yeah. I'm trying to understand. Again, I... I'm just trying to understand what you want me to respond to, but I think... Okay, can we go to another question? Because I think you've taken up a lot of time, so we'll just go to the next question, yours. Hi, good evening. Uh, my question is directed towards Dr. Sen. Firstly, uh, congratulations on being awarded the Bodley Medal by Oxford recently. Uh, Thank you. So one of the big news in India currently is about the minimum income guarantee by the Congress party in the manifesto, which it claims is based upon your theory of the poverty index. Uh, my obvious thought towards it goes in the direction that it's more of a populist swap. It might be a s way to sway the lower income people towards voting for the Congress party. But what do you think, how big an impact it might have in generating public opinion in favor of the party? And how is it actually able to facilitate this considering the current scenario in India? Well, I think that's an excellent question. And in, indeed, uh we have to ask, uh, you know, obviously it will have a positive impact in, uh, for the reason that the earlier gentleman was talking about self-interest and so on. If you get some uh, money in a, in a, in a, in a very easy way, uh, you may be favorably disposed. But its total impact has to be examined. Now, I think this is very important. I think, the, as I understand your position, um, there are two things. One is to ask these critical questions, which you're doing excellently. And the other is that, by and large, I would like Congress better than BJP in this election. But that doesn't mean I have nothing, no criticism to offer to, to, the, to, to the Congress's position. Yeah. And so, uh, press on. That's that, and, and we agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I, I'm a middle, member of the middle class who's definitely not a supporter of the you know, Indra Modi government. He's a middle class <laughs> and person who doesn't support Modi. Yes. He does not support. He does yes. not support. Yeah. And there are definitely some of us. And, uh, and as a, someone who did his undergraduate in Delhi University, I witnessed firsthand what happened at JNU and what happened at Ramjas. So, uh, I, I can speak a lot about what that did happen at those universities. But my question is more on the new political power we're seeing among the peasant class and among the Dalit class, among the long marches we're seeing, as well as the recent incidents in Bhima Koregaon and the reassertion of Dalit identity. I just want to think, I just want to see your views on whether you think that the government fundament, governments, not just the BJP government, but they fundamentally underestimate the a perception of a ruler voter and the idea that they do not have an idea of what's going on and, or whether they can actually ever be a legitimate political force. And do you think that this particular underestimation of Dalit and peasant power can play a large part in influencing at least uh, the results of 
the rural parts of the country during this particular election. Do you want to answer first and then Dr. Singh? Well, I hope it would have a major impact on, on the elections. Uh, but the point is we must realize that for a very long time, I mean, last time you had such big peasant mobilizations was when a man called Narendra Singh Tikayat used to organize those peasant rallies and so on. That was really kind of in the 70s. For a very long time, you hear of peasant suicides, but you don't hear of peasant protests. So that the revival of peasant resistance is a very new thing. In, in a sense, it is a kind of revival of politics that you are seeing now. I think throughout the last several decades, there really was much more of identity politics of various kinds, but not really this kind of mass a revival of mass protests, irrespective of identities and so on, you know. Uh, and, and I hope it has an impact. But you see, this is the kind of thing which actually the government gets very worried. The moment there is a terrorist action of some kind, they heave a sigh of relief. Because now the discourse can be shifted to Pakistan and this and that. But the moment you actually have once more talking of these kinds of issues, they begin to get worried. And I think, I think peasant protest was a very important reason, peasant disaffection, very important reason for the loss uh, by the BJP of these central Indian states in the last assembly elections. <coughs> And I think if that carries over to the parliament elections, then of course there would be a very substantial loss for them. Mm. Thanks. Um, good evening, panel. Uh, my question is um, more on the practical side. Um, given the talks that we just had, um, how would a voter, how should rather a voter decide like um, what to choose, what, what decision should be made when they go to the board, uh, voting panel. And um, lastly, is it merely boiled down to uh, let's just vote the lesser of the two evils? I mean, it really boils down to what? Choosing the lesser of the two lesser evils. Lesser of the two evils. I mean, both the parties have been accused of various things. And that's it. Thank you. The what? No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> OK, I mean. I think quite often it is, actually, lesser of the two evils in the sense that, you know, it's really how we uh, see these things, because when someone is doing some good but a lot of bad, uh, you could say that it is uh, evil is too strong a word, I think, and it's too uh, deep in religiosity for me to be able to use it very easily. But um, lesser of two bad things, that's what it is. That's what choice is about. More of good things and <laughs> less of bad things. So there's nothing surprising. It'll we'll end up being less of bad things. And you won't get a person who is exactly, uh, you're saying what a voter chooses. Uh, the, um, you may find someone who you like voting for, and then most people won't agree. I mean, uh, for many years, my favorite candidate, my representative in 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 in, in, in something in Keton, uh, was someone who would irritate both, well, certainly BJP, but also Congress and the Communist Party for very different reasons. Uh, uh, that was the former speaker of the Indian. Assembly. Uh, mm. uh, uh, he, uh, he was a communist and he stood for the Communist Party. Hmm? Somnath Chatterjee. Somnath Somnath. 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 Sorry, I didn't mention the name. Somnath did. Somnath Chatterjee. Somnath Chatterjee. He did. And that, of course, was disliked by my Congress friends. But then the communists disliked it because they expelled Somnath. <laughs> on grounds of, I have to say, since I have got somebody here who is more involved with the Communist Party than I am, complete misunderstanding of the role of a speaker. Once you are a speaker, you cannot pursue the interest and take the whip of one of the parties which got you elected. On that ground, to, to chastise him, uh, 
is a, is a mistake. You know, there's always um, scope for misunderstanding. And uh, so I was very pleased that my candidate was attacked by everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think you're right. I think we have to recognize that good and bad comes mixed. I don't when this gentleman said that he is against Modi. I would like him also to count. I think the count brings out quite clearly that at this time Modi's uh, bad influences are much stronger than this good influences. But uh, uh, is, is that as bad as North Korea? No, I don't think it is. <laughs> right. And I'll just answer in a sentence before Prabhat answers, because um, I think I would vote along the lines of choosing an approach and thinking of whose approach is going to help me more. Do I want freedom of speech? Do I want freedom of association? Do I want to be able to go to a university and study freely of all the textbooks which are full of facts and not full of mythology? Do I want to have a love marriage across caste or religion? Uh, do I want people who are poorer than me to have at least basic food and uh, free education, healthcare. I would choose an approach rather than thinking about uh, lesser of two evil even. And in that approach, I would not think about the leaders, that you know, is it this leader versus that leader? Because ultimately, it's going to be through consensus and hopefully a parliamentary democracy will prevail. And so people will come to some consensus together. So I would look for the approach and vote for the right approach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to say one thing. I think, of course, one should choose the lesser of the two evils. But I think looking at it as simply greater or lesser of two evils underestimates, understates the seriousness that currently the Indian polity is facing. Because as Ruchi has said, we actually are having a threat of fascism. We are having a situation where students of JNU are, 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 are being charged under sedition. We have had people who are civil rights activists who are in jail in solitary confinement at this moment. All kinds of trumped up charges. This is very serious. That being the case, my approach would be vote for the person who you think is the strongest to defeat the BJP. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was really crystal yeah. clear. Thank you. Uh, professors, thank you so much for your talk. That was uh, just very insightful. Uh, I just have a question. Like right around this time when the elections are, so, when we're so close to the elections, there's a general sentiment uh, in the government to shy away from quantitative argumentation and head towards a lot of like, uh, emotional debate. Uh, Lok Sabha becomes, you know, sometimes honestly a pain to watch. Uh, what what kind of uh, you know what do you think what kind of impact does that have on education for the youth of India and uh, just because education as as a whole medium is becoming more holistic in India by the passing day it's not only what happens in the schools but it's also this kind of exposure they have to uh, to argumentation in the government uh, that sort of like dictates their idea of of what it means to be you know to to argue going forward um, and then has a knock on impact on you know on the on the country generally. So what do you think is your, uh, uh, is, is your message to the youth first of all? And do you think that this significantly impacts their education? I think this is a Prabhat question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, just a couple of things. Firstly, have you ever heard the Indian parliament debates or read any of the reports? They're pretty good, you know. The debates, yeah, certainly. I'm not criticizing yeah, the debate at all. I'm just saying this. I mean, recent it's, close it's another election. thing that you see what actually happens is suppose you want to raise an issue. Unless you stage a walkout or walk into the well and so on, the media doesn't take it seriously. As a result, they often do this kind of thing, which is more drama. But when you have serious discussions, you have some excellent presentations. Yeah, and so I agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and likewise, some of the parliament reports are, are, are wonderful, you know, on all kinds of issues, intellectual property rights and so on, very good. Uh, you know, genetically modified crops, the parliamentary committee reports are absolutely first rate. So, so I think uh, we must kind of, you know, cherish that. You know, I mean, I think I, I'm not in favor of debunking the parliament. Mm. Uh, then uh, the, the, the other thing about the youth of India, I mean, I think, I think the youth has to be very concerned about what is happening to the ordinary 
people and, and, and I think the conditions of life of the ordinary people is something which is not really sufficiently appreciated by the youth, particularly in universities and so on. And, and I think that should be, I mean, for instance, there is an emphasis on career. Okay. And, and if that is the case, then you simply have no time. I mean, you know, if, if, if you're a student, uh, you simply have no time to look around to, to, to know what's happening. Starting from school days, I know people in Delhi who shed tears because their child, son, son or daughter, in the school final exam has got only 99%. Now, you, you see that being the case, there is this, this enormous push towards career. And I think that doesn't leave the youth enough kind of breathing space to look at society and what's happening around you. That must be overcome. Thank you. Do one last question. Okay. Uh, hi, good evening. Thank you for being here. So I'm from West Bengal. I'm still scarred by the way we shoot Tata away. My question is the whole lack of emphasis on manufacturing sector overall in the country is really disappointing and honestly scary. We've been promised labor reforms for years now, where the Congress has come in, BJP has come in, we haven't seen the sight of it. We've been promised privatization of loss making units for years now. Again, no mention of this in the manifestos as well. So what, do you think it's possible to achieve eco economic growth, leaving out manufacturing sector and ignoring it altogether? Two experts. <laughs> <laughs> I think the disappointing and indeed uh, extraordinarily disappointing performance of the manufacturing sector is a major drawback for India. It, it is a drawback that is not recognized very clearly when you're just going by the money uh, amount generated. The financial sector can generate easily huge amounts of money in a way that manufacturing cannot. And I think the, uh, there used to be a mistake at an earlier stage in 18th, 19th century, where people described the non-manufacturing, non-agricultural sector as unproductive labor. That was a mistake because a lot of productive work is done through services. And education and healthcare that I was praising are primarily the service sector. On the other hand, and, and, and I'm not going to give any ground for putting focus, especially on education and healthcare as a major neglected field in India. But along with that, the, what has happened to the Indian manufacturing is a question that has not been, I think, adequately addressed at all. And this is where I think what I was calling magic has a part because the numbers look so magically good that this generates that much income and so on. Uh, uh, um, as uh, one of my colleagues told me that, you know, uh, he was filling up his income tax form, which people do in this season. And, and uh, he said he had calculated and he'd come to the conclusion that any time spent on refining your income tax report generates much more income than <laughs> <laughs> any other way of spending your labor. And that may well be correct. Uh, on the other hand, you're right, manufacturing is neglected and very importantly, uh, very important that we, we change that. Do you want to? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I agree that you're absolutely right about manufacturing uh, being one of the weak uh, sectors in the gross performance. Just two comments I want to make. There is not an iota of evidence that manufacturing sector's growth is held up because of the absence of labor market flexibility not an iota of evidence. That is something which is drummed up by all kinds of neoliberal economists, but there's really not an iota of evidence. The, the, the second thing I'd like to say is that when we talk about manufacturing, you're talking only about large-scale manufacturing. As a matter of fact, in India, there is a very substantial small-scale manufacturing sector which is actually getting demolished 
because of demonetization and GST and so on, which is happening. So the government is actually killing that sector, and, and that needs to be protected. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. And uh, um, the, uh, if I may come back to the China-India contrast, the reason China can produce anything, I haven't looked at it, I bet it made in China, almost anything. And Indians can make pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, information technology, and for some reason, this was true about four years ago, they have to end now, motor parts. Hmm. As opposed to 20,000 things that the Chinese can do. Why? Because of literacy, because of being able to read instructions, because of being able to follow, to have quality control by following instructions. So there is a reason why the manufacturing sector, which demands much greater uh, use of uh, school education than, say, agriculture does, uh, is, is, is not getting the, 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 uh, the attention and, and the success that it deserves. So it's not a mystery. And there is a connection between these services, education, healthcare, and the manufacturing products. There is a connection. But I also agree with Robert that small scale production has also a uh, lot to comment. And, and I mean, Bangladesh's success, for example, has been paid very much on cotton textile and so on. So I think there's a these are complex pictures to, 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 to look at, but you're drawing attention to something very important. Thanks. Do we have time for more questions? No, we don't have time <laughs> for more questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but this gentleman has been standing there for a long time. <laughs> I have a question. You know, the topic is good, India at crossroads. India at what? Cross India at crossroads, right? The democracy is a crossroads all over the world, especially in, all over the world, in the US or in India. But these elections will decide because the Baba of Ambedkar graduated from um, Colombia, the constitution is in a crisis in India. And second question is, demortization is... Is the constitution in a crisis? Is the constitution in a crisis? Constitution is? In a crisis. Indian constitution in a crisis. Okay. Yeah. Second question is, Dr. Manmohan Singh versus Modi. Manmohan Singh is the economist. He never did is a demortization and GST. Demo same time, Manmohan Singh, he put a GST, same Modi opposed. But this demortization hurt small business people and small farmers, small household wives. Is this is a viable situation? All our economists, you should address this. Did de demonetization affect small scale industry? Yes, but demonetization but affect negatively has, small yes, scale it has. industry. Is it good for India or bad for India? Of course, bad for India. I mean, by now everybody says that. Even the Reserve Bank's own data show it. That you know the whole idea behind demonetization is that if the currency notes get killed, as it were, then you can thereby reduce the liability of the central bank. And that being the case, that much money, as it were, is available to the government, and the government can distribute it among the poor. But it turns out that 99.3% of the demonetized currency came back to the banking system. So it had no impact as far as the uh, black economy is concerned, as far as raising resources for the government is concerned, but it simply created massive disruption as far as the people were concerned, including small business, as you see. Most of the Indian educators, people are thinking that, especially youth, demonetize is good for the country, but especially intellectuals, you should give a good message. Demonetize is, is messed up with a common pheasants. Common where, man. Yeah, where are you reading that demonetization? <laughs> <laughs> That's you're, what I heard, you know, because... You're reading it somewhere. 
You're, you're not how you are. Huh? I thought that there was a lot of jubilant uh, no. war cries at one stage, but they have died down. Because, you know, people in the village, my mom, she lost 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees. That's right. She couldn't able to cash it. My mom is 8 year old. She said, my money is in paper. We have to wrap up. I'm really sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so, all the questions from the audience, Professor Bilgrami, Professor Patnaik, and Professor Sen. Yeah for taking out the time uh, at this critical moment in India's history to have this discussion. There's a lot at stake. And I believe, as uh, someone of my generation, that literally what is at stake is the choice between fascism and no fascism.